In this section, we will learn how to use Taylor polynomials to find approximations to functions, and we'll talk about how accurate these approximations are. So before we jump into talking about how to approximate functions using Taylor polynomials, let's review a few of the concepts that we've seen so far. We've learned about power series. Power series are, we think of infinite polynomials. It's an infinite series, an infinite summation, where we have the variable x, and the general form of a power series is the sum, n goes from 0 to infinity, of some coefficients times x to the a to the nth. And we say that this is centered at a, that's the value here. So this is the general form for a power series. And we want to regard power series as infinite polynomials, polynomials that just keep going to infinitely higher degrees. In the last section, we talked about starting with a function and finding the Taylor series for that function centered about a. The Taylor series for a function is a power series that converges to that function. That just means it looks more and more like that function on some radius of convergence about the center. We have some examples with finite radii of convergence and other examples where we have infinite radii of convergences. Our definition for the Taylor series was this summation right here. And the key idea behind this formula is that the derivatives of this series match all of the derivatives of the original function when x equals a. That's how this formula is defined. That's where it comes from. This is a power series centered at a. There are infinitely many terms here. If we stop at some degree n, then we have something called the Taylor polynomial. So the Taylor polynomial is simply a truncation of the Taylor series. This is the Taylor polynomial. It's the same form as the Taylor series, but instead of going to infinity, we just stop at degree n. If we were to expand out this sigma notation and stop at degree n, this is exactly what we'd get. This is called the nth degree Taylor polynomial of the function centered at a. The first n derivatives of this polynomial match the first n derivatives of the original function when x equals a. So our notation here is t sub n, t for Taylor, the nth degree Taylor polynomial for the function centered at a. Here's the big idea for this section. We can use Taylor polynomials to approximate functions. A Taylor polynomial will look more and more like the original function f of x the more terms that we take in the expansion. So this will allow us to estimate values of a function near x equals a by using a polynomial. Let's talk about why this is significant. Why do we care about having a polynomial to approximate functions? Well, let's just think of some generic functions here that aren't polynomials. Let's think of, say, e to the x. And let's think of, uh, how about sine of x? What if we wanted to find values of these functions? How would we do that? Well, you could say plug it in a calculator, but how does a calculator do it? And if we didn't have a calculator, how could we find values of these functions? What if we wanted to find, say, sine of 1? What's sine of 1 equal to? Well, we'd have to plug it in a calculator to figure that out. In this section, though, we will see how to use a polynomial to approximate sine, and we can find the value of sine of 1 to a high degree of accuracy by using just a polynomial. In this case, the polynomial that we'll see in, a, in an example further on is x minus x cubed divided by 6. This polynomial is the third degree Taylor polynomial for sine. And we could approximate sine of 1 by just plugging in 1 in for x. So sine of 1 is approximately equal to 1 minus 1 cubed divided by 6. 1 minus 1 sixth, that's 5 sixths. This is actually really close to the true value of sine of 1. That's a very good approximation for sine of 1, and we could get that just by plugging a number into a polynomial. So the point is, it's much, much easier to work with polynomials than to work with these functions in general. And a lot of times a calculator will be using polynomials to find values like this. Using polynomials, we can have much simpler calculations to find values of the different functions. These are approximations. And whenever we do an approximation, there is some error involved. So the error of the polynomial approximation, we use the letter r. We call r the remainder of the Taylor series. Think of the remainder as the error, how far off we are from the true value of the function when we use this approximation for the function value. So when we approximate a function using a Taylor polynomial, we want to have a small value of the error here. We want a small remainder so that our approximation is very close to the true value. It turns out that we can place a bound on the error of the approximation using something called Taylor's inequality. 
Taylor's inequality tells us how close the Taylor polynomial approximation is by giving an upper bound on the error. So we're thinking about taking some function f of x, we're finding a degree n Taylor polynomial, and we're wondering how good our approximation is. What's the error? Taylor's inequality gives us a bound on the error. It says that the error, absolute value, will always be less than or equal to this expression here. So we have an n degree approximation, and that's where this n plus 1 comes from. a is where we center, and this is going to be valid for all the x values between x and a. Then we have this value m here. m is a bound on the n plus first derivative. And this will likely be a little confusing at first, but we're going to work through some examples so we understand how to get the value of m when we find a bound on how bad the error is. So to summarize, we are going to use Taylor polynomials to approximate functions. We'll approximate function values near the center x equals a using a polynomial. There is some inherent error with any approximation, and the error we call the remainder. We can find how bad the error is by giving an upper bound using Taylor's inequality, and we'll work through some examples so that we understand how to get this kind of an expression. In example one, we are given a second degree Taylor polynomial. We have some function f of x, which we don't know what it is, but we're just told that this is the second degree Taylor polynomial for the function f of x, whatever it happens to be. We want to answer all these questions about the Taylor polynomial and the function using this information that we're given. So the first question is, where is the Taylor polynomial centered? Let's start by just writing out the general form of the Taylor polynomial. So the Taylor polynomial of degree n for a function f of x centered around a, it's f of a plus f prime of a divided by 1 factorial times x minus a plus the second derivative f double prime of a divided by 2 factorial times x minus a squared plus, and we continue on until we get to the nth degree term, which is the nth derivative evaluated at a divided by n factorial times x minus a raised to the n power. Here we have a degree 2 Taylor polynomial, so we're just taking these first three terms up to degree 2. Where's the polynomial centered? Let's look at the form in general. We have x minus a, and a is the center. So I'm looking for something of the form x minus a in both these terms. I see x plus 1, and I want to think of this as x minus negative 1. So the center here is a equals negative 1. So if we plug negative 1 in to the nth degree Taylor polynomial, we've got this. f of negative 1 plus f prime of negative 1 divided by 1 factorial times x minus negative 1, which is x plus 1, plus the second derivative at negative 1 divided by 2 factorial times x plus 1 squared. That would be in general the nth degree, or the second degree Taylor polynomial centered at negative 1. Let's line up the coefficients so that we can answer part b. The actual polynomial that we have is 3 minus 2 times x plus 1 plus 4 times x plus 1 squared. We want to know what is f of negative 1, what is f prime of negative 1, what is f double prime of negative 1. Well, f of negative 1 is just the constant term. So f of negative 1, that's just 3. f prime of negative 1 is the coefficient in front of the degree 1 term. So since we have the negative here, f prime of negative 1 is going to be negative 2. For f double prime of negative 1, we have to be a bit more careful. The answer is not just 4. f double prime of negative 1 divided by 2 factorial is what the coefficient is. So let's write that down. f double prime at negative 1 divided by 2 factorial that corresponds to this coefficient of 4. So we can solve here for f double prime of negative 1 by multiplying both sides by 2 factorial. So f double prime of negative 1 equals 4 times 2 factorial. 2 factorial is 2 times 1, which is 2. So we get a value of 8. So the second derivative at negative 1 is 8. Notice, once again, it's not just the coefficient here. It's the coefficient times 2 factorial. So we have to be careful when we find the second derivative at negative 1 just reading it off this expression here. Even though we don't know very much about this function f of x, we can find these exact values straight from the Taylor polynomial. Let's solve part c. We want to find an equation of the tangent line to the function at x equals negative 1. To find the equation of a tangent line, we need two pieces of information. We need the slope of the tangent line, and we need a point that the line passes through. 
So we're looking for a slope of the tangent line, and we're looking for a point that lies on the tangent line. Well, we know that x equals negative 1 here. So the point, we can use a va x value of negative 1. And what is the y value? Well, that's just the function at negative 1. And we solved that in part b. We said that the function evaluated at negative 1 is 3. So we know that a point that the line passes through is the point negative 1, 3. What is the slope of the tangent line? Well, the slope of the tangent line is just the derivative at the point. So the derivative at negative 1 is the slope. And from part b again, we found that the slope is negative 2. So the derivative here is negative 2. We have a slope. We have a point. We can now write down the equation of the tangent line. The equation of the tangent line is y minus the y value equals the slope, negative 2, times x minus the x value. We have the x value of negative 1. x minus negative 1 is x plus 1. We could expand out here and write this in the y equals mx plus b form, but let me write it a little bit differently. I'm just going to add 3 to both sides, and I'll write this as y equals 3 minus 2 times x plus 1. That is the equation of the tangent line. y equals 3 minus 2 times x plus 1. Let me show you a much faster way of getting this answer here. Instead of going through all this work of writing down the slope and the point and using this formula, we can actually find this information straight from the Taylor polynomial. Do you see it? Look at this. Up to degree 1, we have 3 minus 2 times x plus 1. That's the equation of the tangent line. Does this make sense in the context of Taylor polynomials? Well, it should. A Taylor polynomial is trying to match the derivatives of the function. So if we take up to degree 1, we should match both the y value and we should match the slope of the original function. If we've matched the y value and the slope, that's by definition what the tangent line is. So we can find the tangent line to a function by just finding the first degree Taylor polynomial. They are one and the same thing. Once again, the first degree Taylor polynomial approximation, just the constant term and the first degree term, that will match the y value of the function and it will also match the slope. And that's exactly what the tangent line is. Let's take a look at part d. We want to use this polynomial to approximate f of 0. We can do that by just simply plugging in 0 for x into the polynomial, and we'll have an approximate value of the function when x equals 0. So f of 0 is approximately equal to the degree 2 polynomial evaluated at 0. So just plug in 0 here. We have 3 minus 2 times 0 plus 1 is just 1, plus 4 times 0 plus 1, 1 squared. And just simplifying here, 3 minus 2 is 1, plus 4, we have a value of 5. So f of 0 is approximately equal to 5. 5 is the value that we get when we plug 0 into the Taylor polynomial. f of 0 might not be exactly equal to 5. It might be more like 5.5 or maybe 4.8. We don't really know. But we know that the value of the function is pretty close to 5. In order to figure out how close our approximation is, we're going to use Taylor's inequality, which we'll do for part e. Let's start by writing down the statement of Taylor's inequality, then we'll talk about how to use it. Taylor's inequality says that if the absolute value of the n plus first derivative of the function is less than or equal to some value m between x equals a or between x and a, then the remainder, the error, satisfies the following inequality. The error is less than or equal to m divided by n plus 1 factorial times the absolute value of x minus a raised to the n plus 1 power. In the example that we're working through, we found that a equals negative 1. So we're going to think of using negative 1 here for a. And then what is x? Well, x is the place where I'm trying to approximate. I want to know between x and a, how good is the approximation? So x is the place where I'm approximating. So here the x will equal 0. So I have 0 minus negative 1 using x minus a. So 0 minus negative 1, that's what I would put in here to the absolute values. n is just the degree of the Taylor polynomial approximation. So we have n plus 1, that's 2 plus 1, 3. And the only thing we need to really think about here is this m. What is m? Well, m is an upper bound on the n plus first derivative. So we're thinking about the third derivative, and we want to know what's a number that's bigger than the absolute value of the third derivative between the x values here. We are told that the third derivative is always less than or equal to 1 half between negative 1 and 0. This is our between a and x. 
So between a and x, we have this value, which is always greater than or equal to the n plus first derivative. This is our number m. So we use m equals 0.5. Now we can just plug things into Taylor's inequality, and we'll have an upper bound for the error in this approximation. So we plug in m equals 1 half for this example. x minus a, that's 0 minus negative 1, that's 0 plus 1, 1, raised to the 2 plus 1 is 3, divided by 3 factorial n plus 1. So we have 1 half divided by 3 factorial, 3 factorial is 6. This number simplifies to 1 over 12, which is approximately 0 0.083. This tells us that our approximation is no more than 0 0.083 away from the true value of f of 0. So we could say here, we could write it this way. f of 0 is going to be 5 plus or minus 0 0.083. It's within this far of a distance of 5. So it could be, say, 5.001. It could be 5.01, but the value could not be, say, 5.5, because that's not within this interval. So the true value of the function lies between 5 minus 0 0.083 and 5 plus 0 0.83. 5 is a pretty good approximation to this function. At this point, Taylor's inequality probably still looks pretty tricky and a little bit confusing, so we're going to work through some more examples where we'll understand a little bit better how this inequality is used.